Welcome to the business and financial advice show, Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly. Brought to you by Mega, the monthly entrepreneur growth academy. Your very own group of professional peers offering instant tips, training, and business networking. Learn how to have more time and increase your income by joining Mega today. And now, it's time to get your business momentum in action. Many people have thought long and hard about how unsatisfied they are in their jobs. Is this the right job? Should I stay here long term? I'm Scott Card, producer of Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly with Nancy Becker. On today's episode, Nancy talks with her guest, Christy Ogle, founder of five businesses. Christy and her husband both had higher education, yet they were living paycheck to paycheck at their jobs. When faced with a family crisis, Christy began to rethink her professional life. She realized her life was boxed in, working hard, but only earning limited income and limited flexibility. Christy decided her work model was not getting the best results her family needed. And shortly after that, with a new family-first approach to work, Christy and her husband launched their first business. Christy became a student of how bigger companies do things, and even with a lot of mistakes along the way, Today, Christy and her husband have five rousingly successful family businesses, earning far more than their previous jobs. As you hear Christy's story, you too will learn how you can break out of your own box and gain the kind of rewarding income worthy of your hard work and dedication. Let's join our host, Nancy Becker, and her guest, Christy Ogle. Hey there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly, a talk show with business experts for business owners who are tired of waiting for those dang pigs to get up and fly and want their businesses to soar higher now. Today, we are talking with Christy Ogle, who was born in Springfield, Missouri, the eldest of two children. She graduated from Fort Scott Community College with an Associates of Science. Christy then attended the College of the Ozarks, where she worked her way through college at Hard Work U. I love it. While working three jobs, she earned a Bachelor's of Science degree with a major in psychology. She's been married to her college sweetheart, Matt, for over 20 years. She is the mother of three children. Christy moved from Missouri in 2007 and found her home in Texas 13 years ago. Christy was a domestic engineer for 10 years and then began passionately advocating for those with intellectual disabilities for over eight years. She was the statewide coordinator for a planning process for individuals with developmental disabilities for four years. She's the co-founder and CEO of five, yes, five different companies. Christy's biggest company is Sometimes Spouse, which she is the co-founder of, and there are multiple franchises throughout five different states. She's a supporter of many charities all over the country. She is also the co-founder of Sometimes Love, a nonprofit that helps those diagnosed with cancer to get help around the house. Christy's dedicated to helping others and putting family first. She enjoys spending time with her family, camping, traveling, hiking, helping others, and SUPing, I have to figure out what that is, in her free time. Christy's number one priority in life is to put family first and help other families to put their family first as well. Thank you so much, Christy, for being with us today and welcome. Thank you. It's exciting. I'm anxious to jump in here and see what wonderful words of wisdom you have to share. But I've got to know, what is SUPing? (laughs) It is subbing. It's stand-up paddleboarding. So um, I don't surf, but I'll stand on a paddleboard and I'll go down rivers and lakes. But I have to be real careful in Texas because there's gators in our rivers and lakes. So (laughs) I'm only going gator-less places. We were just out in Florida, and everywhere we went in Florida, we saw these signs that said, live baby gators, come and see them. And I'm going, no, thank you. (laughs) Good. I have no interest in seeing a live baby gator. Thank you very much. (laughs) 
Yeah. Yeah. I, when I was in Florida a few months ago, I went and saw some gators, but I, there's no way I'd get in the water when I like knew there was a gator there. Cause it can eat me. No, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm more afraid of a gator than I am. You hear about these uh, sharks that attack people, and you know, in the ocean, and I, you know, how often does that happen? But a gator, that's a different story. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't live with it. No, I'm good. Like, I'll get in the ocean, and I'll go out in the ocean. I, I just, I know there's sharks. I can see them under me. But the thing about a gator is, it looks like a log. Yeah, yeah. and you come upon it, and it just chomps down on you. And I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I think I'm glad I got away without ever having seen a gator. That's perfect. Wow. That's amazing in Florida. <laughs> I tell you, it was wild. Yeah. But, and they were in places where you could go buy t-shirts and fresh fruit and vegetables and all that kind of stuff, you know, and then, oh, by the way, we have gators over here. And I'm going, no, thank you. Anyway. <laughs> now I don't need to eat. I'm good. <laughs> we're totally off the subject. <laughs> I tell you. We are. Let's let us start out our conversation today about how did you become the co-founder of five businesses? That's crazy. So I have to take you back about six or seven years ago before Sometime Spouse even started. Um, I actually was a social worker uh, working with kiddos with intellectual disabilities. But one day I was sitting down at work, getting ready to go for the day, and I get a phone call. And it's my little brother. And he tells me that my grandmother who fallen, had fallen ill and I was raised on a farm. Um, I, my parents went to college. So I was at grandma's farm my entire life. She like co-raised me. I was with her way more often than I ever was with my parents. And I got that telephone call and Bubba said, grandma's fallen ill. They don't think she's going to make it. And she was 94 years old. And I said, okay, I'm going to, I'll be up there in 10 hours because I was in Texas she was in Missouri so um, I'm gonna go into my boss right now go to the house grab some stuff and I'm gonna I'll be there in 10 hours he said okay and so I walked in immediately to my boss and I said I have to go my grandmother's fallen ill she's the woman that helped raise me I've got to go and she goes I'm sorry you can't leave and I said this is my grandma she practically raised me I've got to go I have no choice like she's she's going to pass away. I've got to go and say goodbye to this woman. Mm -hmm. She goes, no, if you leave, you don't have a job. You're the only person here that can do your job. If you leave, you don't have a job. Now I had three babies and a mortgage to pay. So I had to make a tough decision that day and I stayed at work. But thank goodness, my little brother, who's now an adult, he, uh, he said, sis, don't worry about it. I'll get her on Skype tonight. As soon as you get off work, get on Skype with grandma. And I said, okay. So he actually set up Skype in her hospital room and I got to say goodbye to her. Now she was still lucid and she could talk to me. And so we had a conversation. I called her old lady cause that's what I used to call her. And she called me heifer cause that's what she used to call me. And uh, we had a real loving relationship. And then she said, Christy, I want you to know that you've built an amazing family. Your children are beautiful. The marriage you have with your husband is wonderful. You have an amazing family. Always remember, put your family first. And I hung up the phone, the Skype call, and I realized that's what I hadn't done. I chose my job and a paycheck over saying goodbye to the woman that I love deeply. She passed away and I went to her funeral. Thank goodness they had it on a weekend so I could go. Went to her funeral and I was standing there and I stood with her the entire time that I could be there with her, even though she wasn't there anymore. It meant something to me. And we were at the funeral and at the graveside and I watched them. I felt like it was just me there. There was tons of people there, I'm sure, but I felt like it was just me. And in my mind, I was thinking, this is the last time I'm gonna be with my grandmother. And as they lowered her into the ground, I felt something hit me. I felt her say, don't live a box life like I did. 
what do you mean, Grandma? You had an amazing life. And so I started thinking about Grandma's life. And she's amazing. She had 21 brothers and sisters. She was, went through the Depression. She met Grandpa. They had this amazing love story. They had seven children of their own, 21 grandchildren, multiple great-grandchildren. She was a farmer's wife, and she never left the house. She was usually living her life within about three miles of her home. She never had a driver's license. She never traveled out of Missouri and Kansas. She, she lived this kind of boss life, didn't work outside the home. She poured everything into her family, but she missed out on so much. And so I went back home and I thought about that, you know, it kind of hit me and told my best friend a little bit about it. I started looking at my life and actually I was living a box life. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd make the kids box cereal, send them in their box off to school. And then I would get in my box car, drive it to work. And then I'd work on a box all day long until lunch and I'd go and get a box lunch. And then I would work on the box again and I'd drive my box car home. And then I would make the kids a box dinner because that's all we could afford. We were living paycheck to paycheck even though we had professional degrees. And uh, we'd make them hot dogs and macaroni and cheese because that's what we could afford and they liked. So then we would sit there and we'd watch the box every night and for three or four hours. And that's the life I was living over and over and over again. Day after day, that was the same, same thing every day. Even though I did everything I was told to do to have this amazing life, I went to high school, I got married after, uh, I went to college, got married after college, I had three babies, I stayed at home with the babies until I went to school, and then I got this amazing job that was eight to five, Monday through Friday, helping other people, I had a 401k, I had insurance, I had everything I, I was told I should have had, you know, that we were still living paycheck to paycheck in this little duplex in Texas. So one night while I was watching, the nightly news, watching that box, Lester Holt pops on. And there's this woman that comes on there that was living kind of a box life. Um, and she didn't have time to do anything with her family. And she started this organization company in the South. I can't even remember what it was called. And she'd left her regular job, that box job, that average just over broke job. And she started this organization company and she replaced her income within the first year. And so I was it's pretty interesting. So I rewound it and I watched it again. And I rewound it and I watched it again. And I thought, if this woman can do that with organization, I could do it with handyman and household cleaning. My husband was handy. He could be the handyman. I can clean. I mean, I have three kids. And then I didn't want to do all the cleaning myself. I'm going to rope my best friend into it. So that's the night that sometimes spouse was really founded. Was my husband got home. I showed him, I told him my wild idea, but our idea was just to make an extra couple of hundred dollars a month to, you know, loosen the noose around our neck financially. And we started doing sometimes spouse in the evenings, weekends, um, our days off about 10 to 12 hours a week. My husband, best friend and I did. And um, we built this kind of empire with sometimes spouse. Um, within six months, we were able to leave our full-time jobs because we'd replaced our income. And within our first full year of Sometimes Spouse, um, we did six figures. We replaced every single one of our incomes. We actually tripled it. And then within the next year, we were hitting the seven-figure mark. Then we started to franchise. And we started building other businesses. So it all started from grandma telling me to put my family first. And that's what we've done with all of our businesses. Now, um, my kids are my, and my family, my husband are my top priorities. And I can be there, have that freedom and flexibility to be able to do that. Um, I can take off on a whim and go to conferences, go to the coast if I want to, go supping if I want to, the, in gator-proof waters. Um, so that is just a little bit about how Sometimes Spouse began. It came from the past way of my beloved grandma. That's an incredible, incredible story. You're listening to the Business and Financial Advice Show, Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly, with your host, Nancy Becker. There's lots more to come. Nancy and her guest will be right back. Hey, you ready to go shopping? 
Sure, just let me go to the backyard and pick some $20 bills off the money tree. Oh, grab a few for me. A money tree? Hey, you ready to go shopping? I can't afford it. Really? How's your business coming along? Good, but sales could be better, and with all the expenses. You should join the Fast Track. Fast Track? It's the Fast Track Your Cash program. It gives you just the right momentum you need to boost your personal business. The Fast Track Your Cash program is professionally designed to target customers specifically tailored to your business, increasing your revenue. It can happen faster than you think. Feel more empowered with your own unique steps to give you back your time while making your business grow fast. Visit us right now at businesssuccessunlimited.com. Businesssuccessunlimited.com. Fast track your cash. I'm joining today. Are you a small business owner wondering about your next step for growth and success? What if you had your own dynamic group of professional peers? A group that supports your business with fresh new ideas, beneficial training, accountability, and more. MEGA, the Monthly Entrepreneur Growth Academy, is a professional peer advisory group dedicated to supporting fellow business owners. Learn about processes and strategies that will get you more time and money. When I first joined the MEGA group, I was struggling in a business that wasn't right for me. Now, I own a local business where I live out my passion every day. Last year, the revenue of my business tripled and we are on track to hit even bigger goals this year. The accountability and feedback of the MEGA group has been invaluable. The Mega Group can help you focus on the right things and start building momentum. Join the Mega Group today at don'twaittillpigsfly.com. They're big, they're shy, they're invisible, and they fly. They're always late, they never arrive. Don't wait till pigs fly. Get your business momentum in action. Let's rejoin our host of Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly, Nancy Becker. I want to dig in a little bit. Okay. Um, it's, it's wonderful and something that not everybody can say that within, you know, six months, you're making six figures. Let's look at that, though. Let's dissect that a little bit. It didn't just happen. <laughs> it I did mean, not just have it. it is a lot of hard work and strategy yeah and that's what i want to look at i mean i think so often people either people start businesses for the reason you started sometimes spouse just to get a little bit of extra income coming in and i don't think they ever realize the potential or take it that next step you know, it's just, it's always just that little bit of side gig. It's, it's, you know, a way to like make a little bit of extra money. What made it happen for you that you actually built it? You know, from the very beginning, people said, don't have a partner, don't have a business partner. Don't cut out your best friend now. Uh, I heard that probably a hundred times from people that had been in business before, people that thought they knew business. And the great thing about having three people that got started with sometimes spouses, we held each other accountable. And then we also figured out what each of us were good at. I was good at marketing, answering the phones. I didn't know what marketing was six years ago, by the way. I just knew I had to tell people about sometimes spouse so that the phones would ring. And then my husband was really good at operations and he's really good with customers. So he was the one that went out and did the estimates. So if I think back to six years ago, number one, having an accountability buddy, um, even though we didn't know that's what it was called back then, um, Crystal would go, Hey, Christy, did you run that ad in the paper? And I go, Hey, Crystal, did you open that bank account? Like we were keeping each other accountable and we didn't really know it. Another thing is, is like, taking action. So I knew I had to report to Crystal. I knew I could get away with it with my husband and not do stuff. But with Crystal, if I said I was going to do something, I was going to do it. So I have to take action. So I think the major difference between those that always have a side hustle and never really turn it into a full-time gig and somebody that does actually turn it into a full-time gig is actually taking that action and pulling it off and, you know, getting bumps and bruises along the way. But you just keep going because no matter what level of business, 
business that you're at, um, you're always going to get, I say, kicked in the face. And you've just got to be, you better land on your back so that you can hop back up because it, you have to just keep going and take action and you're going to make mistakes no matter who you are and you learn from it. It's a character building kind of day as I call it. I had one of those on Tuesday um, that you just keep going and you keep building and you keep what that mission is that you really want to do and who you want to help in mind. And uh, now the question just, I'm so fascinated with this. The question just went right out of my mind. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> uh, you talked about a little bit about not knowing what marketing was. I mean, even though, yes, action is bottom line. You gotta, you've got to have the action. You can't just, you can't just sit there and wait for pigs to fly. That's not going to yeah. happen. Pigs, I've never seen a real pig with wings. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I haven't either. So, you know, not going to happen. So you said you were really good at marketing, but you didn't know what it was. Yeah. How, how did you figure it out? What did you do? You had to do something to start getting those phones to ring and people to come in and talk to you. Yeah, well, six years ago, we used the newspaper, and I wouldn't recommend that today. So we used the newspaper, and we just had, like, a catchy name, sometimes spouse. People look at that, and I knew in the beginning that I needed something that would catch people's attention and draw me in, even though, like, I had no idea how to market whatsoever. So what I did was I said, sometimes spouse – when I talked to people, I answered the phone like this from the very beginning. Sometimes spouse, would you like to rent a husband or wife today? I love it. And I get the people to laugh. And then they tell their friends to call us. And um, that we do little estimates or whatever. But when I go on Facebook, because I start from the very beginning, I started a Facebook page. And it was called Sometimes Spouse. I would put, we are not an escort service. I didn't even do lives back then. I don't even think I did pictures back then. But um, anytime I would talk to somebody, I'd be like, don't worry, it's legal. So I got them to kind of laugh with us. So I kind of used a marketing technique that I now know gets the customer because you got to stop their scroll. You got to catch their attention and draw them in. Right. And the name caught their attention. And when they started talking to me, I'm really good at building relationships because I was a social worker. And um, so I used that relationship building skill and crystal had those same skills. And I taught them to my husband who was a mechanic and um, we had this kind of beautiful um, group of people that it, people just loved one of us. Yeah. That that's incredible. That's that's great. And yeah. and I I know that especially since you've now got franchises, there's there's so much that's got to be involved in maintaining your sanity for one thing. Yeah. <laughs> and keeping it's all, you know, good and, and well when you get somebody to come in the first time. What do you do? And and I'll give you a clue, it's called customer service. <laughs> You know, what do you do to keep those people coming back and to refer you to others? So I, I learned pretty quickly that we grew rapidly. Uh, we were very lucky. Um, it was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of skills that we used, but I can't say that I did it all by myself. I actually um, started taking classes. I started going to seminars. I started going to conferences. I started studying people like Dale Carnegie, Jim Rohn, Tony Robbins, Russell Brunson, um, Grant Cardone. I started studying people that were really good at sales and marketing. And then when I started franchising, I started studying people that had done that before me. So I studied um, Ray Kroc McDonald's, right? I studied Sam Walton, even though that's not a franchise model. I studied um, Truett Cathy from Chick-fil-A. I studied Curves um, that was the first one that I studied because they actually started in Waco, Texas. I reached out to salesmen that had sold for Curves and I had lunch meetings with them. I reached out to the founders of Curves and I had meetings with them and they actually became our mentors. Somebody that had franchised 855 Bugs in Waco, Texas, I got a meeting with him and he actually showed us how to franchise and put systems and operations and customer service in place. And what I did was was I took decades worth of knowledge and I put it into days and that enabled me to put a strategy out there to grow our business rapidly even though I didn't know it was rapidly 
I just knew I didn't want to make the same mistakes other people had made. Because um, Curves actually had about 14,000 franchises and it went down to about 1,400. Um, and they're still alive today, which is amazing. A lot of people that would take a hit like that wouldn't survive. Um, and it, they, I learned so much from them, but I still made my own mistakes. I still thought, you know what? I know better than these people do. And I didn't listen to some of the advice. And it, it was huge financial mistakes. We lost hundreds of thousands of dollars because we didn't listen to the people that had done it before. So <clears throat> learning those strategies and finding mentors and business that could help you grow rapidly have been amazing. Um, and I think that's a huge part of our success. Yeah, um, and it's something that I talk about with my, my listeners and my clients all the time is that if you're going out there, and I've heard it so often, if you're going out there and you're saying, I can do this on my own, I don't need any help, you're not going to be around very long. I had one person that we had a storefront in a little town where we were running the business. We, we had a co-work center. And there was this store across the street that had a name that I still can't figure out what it means. And I would go in periodically and look around and see what they were doing. And I would say, you know, tell me more. I'm, I am a referral person. I love to have, you know, businesses that I can send my clients to. So, but I need to know what it is you do. And she mumbled something. And then she says, well, what is it that you do? And, and at the time I said, well, I'm, I'm score on steroids. <laughs> you know, it just was, was telling me. And she goes, oh, well, I hate score. And I went, okay. And she says, I've been doing this for 18 years. I can't possibly imagine anyone could tell me how to run my business. Two and a half weeks later, there was a going out of business sale on her front door. <laughs> You know, it's just, you're really, really wise in realizing that we've, we're never alone. We've never been the only ones doing something. Mm -hmm. And if we can take from the experts, you in this case, everybody listening, listen to what Christy's saying, because it makes so much sense and gets you there faster. Yeah. Yeah. And plus, people think that, oh, well, I've got a really unique business. I'm going to do this, like exotic animal, I don't know, sales. Somebody's done it before you, and they've written a book about it, and they're an expert in it. Somebody's been in a business that's similar to yours, or they've had a product that's similar to yours. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a handyman in household business, or you're selling tires on this, you know, from a local shop. The, the same fundamentals of business work in both of those kinds of businesses, whether it's a product, a service, a consulting, whatever it may be, the same key components work no matter what business it is. So even though you might have done it for 20 years, maybe you've never tried to grow or you've never tried to learn more about business. If you don't, you're not going to make it in the business world. You have to continue to grow or you'll just stay right where you're at or lose it. Right. Absolutely. And I think a follow on to that whole concept of learning and figuring out what other people have done either to figure out it's something that I want to do myself or something that I don't want to do myself. You then have to implement it. Mm -hmm. And you talked several times about processes and strategies I'll say that to somebody and they'll plug their ears. They don't want to hear, you know, they don't, they don't understand a process, a strategy or, and it just sounds like it's too much work. Mm -hmm. so talk to me a little bit about what you mean by processes and strategies and how you implemented them to grow your business. Yeah, before we started franchising, we were kind of a mess. Um, we used this system for doing the calendar. We used this system for financials. I mean, we had a system um, that made it easier, but once you start franchising, you have to have everything in an operations manual that says, this is how we market. This is how we create raving fans. This is how your financials work. This is what your profitability should be. This is exactly what you should have in payroll. This is how much you should pay in taxes. This is what your profitability should be. Once you have that and you understand, when you look at those numbers, which are facts, those numbers are the biblical truth in your business. 
and you can look at them and understand them and be able to know where your business is going a little bit awry or what you need to tweak just a little bit. When you tweak it, it's usually by about 2% to make it go from, you know, outstanding to, or from uh, good to outstanding. It's pretty amazing. It's Those numbers are the facts. So once you can understand those systems and how it can affect those numbers, it makes your business run a lot more smoothly. That cash flow is not as big as an issue, an issue um, and you can have that kind of room to grow and know, okay, I need to tweak this a little bit to make more profitability. It's just facts. You've got to know your numbers in business. And from learning those systems, I finally got it for the financials because I'm not the financial person. That's Crystal. She's our CFO. But which I could, as a marketer and as running the franchise, could look at those numbers and look at like a franchise, their P&Ls come in and their payroll's really out of whack or they're not spending enough on advertising or marketing. Once you understand those systems that put everything in place for your financials, uh, it makes it much more profitable for you as a business owner and entrepreneur. You have to pay attention to all the aspects of your business and know how to read it or you're going to just go off awry. Yeah. Let's dig a little bit more into systems themselves. And, and let's just go to a basic level because in, in seriousness, I have talked about systems to people and they'll go, what do you mean? What's a system? Let's talk about what systems are. What is it that you're implementing to help get to those numbers? So the way that our business works at Sometimes Spouse, I can teach you, or I teach people how to get the phones to ring, number one. Um, and then from phone call to the job being completed, I can map it out every aspect, even on the back end. So even when we're done with a customer, we're not done because you have to, there's so much noise in 2019, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, the TV, radio, billboards, you're constantly being attacked as a customer. So you've got to stay um, on the forefront of the customer's mind. So you've got to keep up on the back end too. So they won't go to the next person that does the same exact thing that you do. So we have a system for everything, for getting the phones to ring all the way to um, on the back end of the customer. Even before that, it's even setting up your business um, like a business, not like just a hobby. So you need a place to go to run your business. Uh, you need to have a dedicated space. If you work from home, you need to have a desk or, you know, a cert I would say a desk. I wouldn't use a kitchen table, which is a catch-all or a coffee table or anything like that. Not in front of the TV. A certain place you go. And this is where you do your work. And this is what you do when you get to work. 8 a.m. Like, everything. I know exactly how much time I'm spending on every single business, every single week. I have my weeks mapped out. Sunday night, I sit down and I look at what I'm doing for the next week and what my top goals are, which are always written down on a pad in front of me. Um, and what am I doing that's going to make these goals happen every single day? And I look at them and I write them down in another book every single day when I come to work. So I have a system for almost every part of my life. Now that doesn't mean I'm a stick in the mud. I do have fun when I'm not. Uh, I have fun when I'm at work because I love what I do, but um, I do spontaneous things still. But I have to have a system or uh, the day's gonna run me and I'm not gonna run the day. You're listening to the Business and Financial Advice Show. Don't wait till pigs fly with your host, Nancy Becker. There's lots more to come. Nancy and her guest will be right back. What does business success look like to you? What does business success feel like to you? What stands between you and that feeling? Business success is all about momentum. Mega, the monthly entrepreneur growth academy, will help you focus on the right things and start building that momentum. The Mega Group is a network of dedicated professionals. They provide focused training and excellent support as only a personal advisory group can. Learn tips, strategies, and valuable insights to unleash your productivity. Isn't it time to stop spinning your wheels? Go to don'twaittillpigsfly.com and join the Mega Group today. Hey, you ready to go shopping? 
Sure, just let me go to the backyard and pick some $20 bills off the money tree. Oh, grab a few for me. A money tree? Hey, you ready to go shopping? I can't afford it. Really? How's your business coming along? Good, but sales could be better, and with all the expenses. You should join the Fast Track. Fast Track? It's the Fast Track Your Cash program. It gives you just the right momentum you need to boost your personal business. The Fast Track Your Cash program is professionally designed to target customers specifically tailored to your business, increasing your revenue. It can happen faster than you think. Feel more empowered with your own unique steps to give you back your time while making your business grow fast. Visit us right now at businesssuccessunlimited.com. Businesssuccessunlimited.com. Fast Track Your Cash. I'm joining today. Radio and podcast shows are the fastest growing media of the decade. The better the sound, the better the impact you will have with your listeners. Hi, I'm Scott. I'm a producer editor for radio and podcasts. If you have your own podcast, I can help with editing, improved audio quality, your own theme music, and intros and outros. Would you like a commercial for your small business? Connect with me for a sound approach to your podcasts and commercials. My email is scott at worldwithinreach.com. Scott at worldwithinreach.com. What you said about writing it down, my clients will tell you that's, they hear that at least 20 times a conversation <laughs> with yep. me is write it down. Mm -hmm. There's something about writing it down that not only keeps you on track, but makes it more real. Yeah. You know, I think that's so important. And then when you're talking about following up with clients, uh, is that using a CRM system? Is that, you know, how, how do you follow up? How do you keep track of where your customer is in the, to use, you know, a term that everybody knows these days, the funnel, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? So I use lots of stuff online to follow up with my customers. Um, I have a pixel on my Facebook page that is continually reminding them about sometimes spouse if they went to our page or they've never looked at any of our ads. Um, I use a lot of Russell Brunson's um, information and training that he's put out there. Um, and then I teach that to all of the people that are in sometimes spouse family and the franchisees. Um, and then also uh, I use a drip campaign with emailing. Um, I'm constantly adding value. So when I advertise or I market, it's not specifically buy from me, buy from me. There's actually three forms of a relationship with a customer. Number one is it's kind of a selfish relationship. Um, you have something that I need and I'm going to get it from you. Or as the business owner, I want to sell to you so I can make money. It's one form of the relationship. The second form of the relationship is you have something I need and it's going to be mutually beneficial. You have a hole in the wall. We're going to fix the hole in the wall. We're going to make money. Everybody's happy. Fix the hole in the wall. We make money. It's kind of a mutual relationship. But the third level of a relationship, which is so special, is where I anticipate your needs as a customer before you even know you have this need. So I look at my target market for my customer and I think about what is it they're laying in bed at night worrying about. Uh, it could be uh, financials, it could be um, holes in the wall or they want to change the garage. It's also about their family because the average family only spends about 36 minutes together a day. So I add value. So I write articles, I do podcasts, I do lives on things that families are worrying about or they're thinking about at night or they're talking about doing. Um, I also keep on the cusp of whatever's buzzworthy um, and I'll report, I'll put articles other people have written up or videos other people have written up. I add value and I only sell to my customers about 15% of the time. So I'm always adding value to my customers and they keep coming back over and over and over again. But I do use all those systems online, but um, I want them to know that I care about them and their families and we want it to be better. Yeah. Not just handyman and household cleaning services. Yeah. And, and you actually have two very different 
types of customers. You have your end result clients that you are fixing the hole in the wall, mm -hmm. but your other client is actually your franchisees. Yeah, we've actually got under just the business of sometimes spouse. We've got several different kinds of clients. So number one, we have handyman clients, that one time person that calls. We have house cleaning clients that have a deep clean or light clean that we go out and we do once. We've also got residual uh, commercial clients on both sides. So it gets you're you're going after different people, even though it's the similar thing. And then you have the franchisees, which is a totally different business than this. Like totally different, totally different target market, totally different mindset, totally different support. It's a residual income, yeah. It's gonna come to us for years and years and years. But the support that you stay on with those franchisee for those years, uh, you have to consider the brand as a whole with everything that you're doing. It can't be anything selfish. It's not about Christy Ogle, Max Ogle, or Crystal Stewart anymore. It is about the families and the people we're helping, customers, employees, franchisees. Uh, so it's much bigger. That was one of the hardest things, Nancy. It, took, it was probably a year into franchising before I realized, I've got a bunch of different businesses. I need to figure this out and I need to figure it out fast. Because I thought you took care of a franchisee like you took care of a customer and it's totally different. Nobody taught me that. It wasn't in any of the books. So it was a hard lesson to learn. Yeah, yeah. And I just, while well, you talk, and I thought there's still another customer that you have, and that's your employee. Yep. You know, that's, and that again is an entirely different. How do you integrate, separate, keep everybody happy all the time? You can't keep everybody happy all the time. It's impossible. But what I do personally is I continue to grow. I continue to teach. I continue to help. So this morning before I was on the podcast with you, I was teaching the seven strategies for creating raving fans to my franchisees on our morning sales call. So when I think about creating those raving fans, I can't just think of one or two customers that I need to create raving fans with. I've got to do it across the board because my employees are the ones that go out and do the work and they're the ones that actually are face to face with the customers. So they have to be trained on that as well as the ones representing the brand across the states um, with the franchisees. So that's one thing that I continually train on about every three weeks is creating raving fans, creating raving fans creating raving fans because you have to have that because if not, they just fall off. And, you know, it seems at times that, especially when you're a larger business, which you obviously are, it seems at times that business owners or the managers or whatever really don't care if they lose a client because there's all that many more down the road coming. So it doesn't matter if you lose one person. I've been there, Nancy. After we sold a ton of franchises in the very beginning and we got, a, I mean, I sold three in one day. That ego. Yeah. Something you gotta keep in check, Nancy. I've been there. Yeah. I thought, you know what, I don't care. And I actually sold our uh, mother franchise, um, the one in Waco, Texas, that we grew to over a million dollars. But well, I'm a big franchisor. I've been told by a couple people I shouldn't be owning a franchise anymore. I should just franchise, right? So we sold this cash cow to somebody and people would come up to me and say something about Waco and I'd go, I don't care. I don't care. I don't have anything to do with Waco anymore. Like I'll talk to him about it, but I don't care. I don't own it anymore. And uh, even though I supported him, sold it for a large amount of money, he was actually in-house and had more training than anyone ever has. He tanked it. Took it from a million dollar business to under a hundred thousand dollars. We had to acquire it back, bought it back for about a buck. I mean, he tanked it, got it back. And I thought, you know what? I still don't, hard lesson. I'm hard headed. I'm from Missouri. You got to show me. And uh, for, I put a branch manager in there. They tanked, couldn't do it. Couldn't get sales over a couple thousand dollars a month. And then I thought, well, I'll just get another branch manager in there. I'll train them. Couldn't do it. Took it back over about four months ago. And uh, we're back up to selling just ginormous amounts of uh, sales in Waco, Texas. 
that ego, Nancy, boy, once money starts rolling in and you, you start to get a taste of success and other people are telling you what it should be instead of like what you know. What you know, I knew at my core that I needed to keep my hands on the baby, but I had franchisees go, you're never going to care as much about my franchise as you do Waco. You need to sell it. They never done what I'd done before. Why would I listen to that? Right. And then after I sell it, I have franchisees that said, well, you're not in the game anymore. You don't understand. So like I listened to people that I really shouldn't have listened to. And then that ego got in the way because everybody said, you're a CEO of a big company. You shouldn't be doing that. You should like be running, you shouldn't worry about another franchise, whereas I can do multiple things. But other people were telling me, this is what your beliefs should be. And I replaced my beliefs with their beliefs. And I thought to be successful, I needed this big fancy office. I needed multiple salespeople. I don't need that. What I need is Max Crystal and I, a couple of people that actually add value to our business and add value to our customers all the way around. And they need us. They don't need somebody else that's never done it before. So, man, yeah, that's tough. The ego gets in the way sometimes with growth. But, boy, I learned a hard lesson. It's a character-building year. Yep. I had, I had something very similar happen years ago when I was running my uh, administrative assistant company. And I had started out in this, you know, it was a factory that they were uh, changing over into an executive suites. At my office was literally in the vault. <laughs> We'd open the big vault door every morning and pull all the office equipment out and sit it in the middle of the room. Every night we'd push it back in the vault, close the vault, you know, crank the... And I had IBM, which was a big thing back uh, so many years ago, yeah. you know, come to me and say, look, we've just built this brand new building on the other side of town and we want to start an executive suites in it. It's a beautiful building. And part of what you would be doing is renting the office space to people. Uh -huh. I, had, I had a thriving business going in this vault, <laughs> you know, but I decided, oh, they came to me. They asked me to do this for them. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get out of the dirt and the blue jeans and the, you know, all that. I'm going to be able to wear suits and nice things like that and go and sit in cool air conditioning and be, you know, the queen. And uh -huh. I'm just going to leave my office manager to take care of these people over here. Wound up, sure shooting, the office manager went around to everybody in the, the successful building that we had and told them all that I didn't care about them anymore, that I had deserted them. And that she was there to take care of him. And she started her own business and took all my clients. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I've been there. I've done that. I, I get it. You know, it's, and believe me, I'll never do that again. Because huh. it really is two things from, from this conversation. We cannot allow our egos to get in the way because that's what happens. And we can't listen to other people. We know what's right, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and while the customer is not always right, the customer has to be top of brain mm -hmm. at all times, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, so. Because without the customer, you don't have a business. That's right. That's yeah. right. You can make the best widget in the world, but if nobody wants it, then you're not going to be in business for very long. Yeah. You know? So uh, we just, I could keep going and going and going all day with you, but we're getting sort of towards the end of our time. What have we not talked about that you have to share? <laughs> well, really my mission in every one of my businesses that I do is we want to help families get out of that box life. And we want to help 1,204,732 families put family first. You've only got about 940 Saturdays between the time your baby's born and they go off to college. And once they're gone, the biggest regret that people have across the world, because I've interviewed people from everywhere across the United States and the world um, with sometimes spouse, and their biggest regret is they didn't spend time with their family when they were young. And by the time their family went to college, they got their own life, they got their spouse, they started having children, then they don't have time for them. And they're trying to make it up with the grandkids. Don't put family first from the very beginning. 
And we do that through all the different organizations and nonprofits that we do is to help families put family first because that is so important because that's what you have at the end of the day. So you don't have to make choices like I had to make with grandma that you can put your family first, that my children always come first. I get to drop them off at school, even though I'm a CEO every single morning uh, until my 16 or my 16 year old son gets his driver's license. I'm really worried about that. But I get to live with them. I get to get home in the evenings instead of worrying about what's going on at work or what's happening on a screen. I get to sit around the dinner table with my kids and actually hear about their day. And on the weekends, they actually want to spend time with me as their mother, even though they're all teenagers. Everyone should have that. It's not a luxury in life. Everyone can have it. You just have to kind of plug into your life and put that remote control of your life, which is your cell phone down, and be interested in what they're doing and just love them. Because once that time is gone, it's gone. You can't ever get it back. That's one thing you can never put a deposit in. Yeah, no, and you're so right. And I can about, oh, geez, over, a little over 10 years ago now, my husband and I packed up every single one of our possessions, closed down our businesses, and moved from Washington, D.C. back here to Michigan just to be with my parents to take care of them. And we had them from 2008 until my dad died in um, 17 my mom died in 15. So we had them for that period of time. It was the best time in my life was being able to be with them, take them places, joke with them, you know, love them. But I am going to jump in here and ask you a very deep question that I know people are thinking. And that is, you say, put family first. That's great. That's wonderful. But you did it yourself. You didn't go see your grandma. You mm -hmm. stayed at work. You had to have that paycheck. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how do you do that? Well, you really have to evaluate your life. If you are a 40, 40, 40 scam, what I mean is you work 40 years of your life for 40 hours a week for 40% of your paycheck when you retire, it's going to be hard to put family first. Your boss is going to be in control of your life, your entire life. You've really, if you really want to put your family first, you're, you're either going to have to have a job that they don't care, which I don't, I've never seen a job like that, but uh, you're going to have to take that side hustle, that business that you've been thinking about, that book you've been thinking about writing, that podcast that you wanted to start. You have to just do it. You have to go out there and do it. And you do it together and you balance it because you can. I've done it. You balance it until that side hustle takes over that 40, 40, 40 scam. And you start start building it and you take action and you do it and you can have amazing results. But do know you're going to get kicked in the face sometimes and you have to just jump back up and get going. Uh, that's the way that you can put your family first. Now, I'm not going to, I took jobs to put my kiddos first when I was a paraprofessional when I had, you know, a four year degree, I was an ice cream store assistant manager. And um, so I could kind of put my family first, but always I was never in control of my life. Somebody else was in control of my destiny. The only way you're going to truly be free is to be an entrepreneur and do your side hustle and turn it into a full-time hustle. Millions have done it before you. You just have to learn from them a strategy that works for you. I, I think one of the things that I'm trying to get at at this whole thing though, is that for a time, you may actually have less time with your family while you're growing the side hustle. And that's okay because you're still doing it so that eventually you will have the time with your family. Is that what it boils down to? Well, I've always involved my children in every part of my business. So uh, my oldest daughter, who's 19, is our receptionist now at Sometimes Spouse. I'm actually grooming her to be CEO in you know, 20 or 30 years. Um, my youngest daughter, um, she always, they were, you know, putting, folding flyers. When we'd go out and do door to door in the very beginning, they would, I'd give them 20 bucks for putting cards in people's doors. Um, I always had them involved. If you can get your family involved in growing the business with you, it becomes like a family affair. So you can actually spend more time with them when you're doing it. Cause those kids are sitting there and they're watching mom and dad and they want to interact with you. 
So think of something that could take it off your plate for the kiddos to do. And if they don't fold that flyer exactly right, who cares? No customer is going to go, I'm not going to use them because I didn't use fold the, uh, the, the flyer right. So, I mean, think of how you can involve them and in your excitement, but in turn, also remember, you want to show excitement for whatever it is they, they love. If your son loves dinosaurs and you absolutely hate them, fall in love with dinosaurs. If your daughter loves soccer and you've never known what soccer is, figure it out. Introduce her to people that have played soccer in college. Introduce her to people that are uh, people that are trying out for the Olympics. Like, get involved in what they love and they'll get involved in what you love. Because I think so many people think, no, you have to really separate business and family, which most people do. That's what we were always told, right? But I was always told to go to college, get a degree, get an eight to five, get insurance and 401k. That didn't work for me. So I'm not listening to those people anymore. I'm involving my family in what I'm building. And in doing that, it's beautiful. Yeah. I agree. And that is a wonderful thought to end this conversation on. Thank you so much, Christy. Everybody listening, please get out your notes, get out your pen, write these things down. They are such important lessons to learn. And, you know, if you have questions, Christy, how do they get a hold of you? Um, they can find me online, sometimesspouse.com, or they can email me, Christy, at sometimesspouse.com, two S's. They can also call my office because I take calls and help people. I answer questions about building businesses um, all the time at 254-315-1922. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on everything. So you can find me in your LinkedIn. Find me on there, Christy Ogle. That's OG Kelly. Everybody take advantage of this wonderful woman and her experience, expertise, and kindness. You can hear this and other podcasts with other wonderful business owners Thursday evenings at flyingpigs.podbean.com. We would love to hear from you. We ask that you subscribe, download, share these episodes, and most of all, listen to them and implement the suggestions in them because it's through doing that that you take your business to the next level and soar higher. Until next time, everybody, we will talk to you again. Take care. Have a productive week, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. That's our show for today. We'd like to extend special thanks to our great guest, our sponsors, and our wonderful listeners. Today's show was produced by Scott Card. To find more of Nancy's podcasts and our sponsors, go to Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly dot com. <laughs> <laughs>